so I'm going to call this meeting to order at 6.01. And I will say this meeting is being recorded. I do actually have the recording on this time, which is a positive. Um, if anyone else is recording, please let me know at this point. I suspect that no one is. Um, let's do a roll call. So, Councilor Jarvis. Present. Councilor DeSorger. Here. Councilor Hirschfeld. Here. Councilor Elmer. Here. And I am here as well. And we also have directors Letourneau and Adams with us. So, hello, everybody. Thank now that we're convened, thanks everybody for coming, particularly uh, the directors that are with us. So let's move right along. Um, our first two items, uh, there are no public hearings. Oh, sorry. Um, do I hear a motion to approve the minutes of December 8th, 2020? Skip the one. So, so Jarvis. Second okay, and I'm, I'm gonna take Jarvis and Elmer on that one. Um, any discussion? All those in favor of accepting the minutes from December 8th, say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you. Um, I was so anxious to get to our uh, updates from Director Adams that I almost skipped that step. <laughs> so with that, I think our, our first two items are the community and small business survey and also the first national bank survey i would say take those in whatever order you feel makes sense oh but you're muted mj i always forget to do that there you um, go. <laughs> so the um as i told you i shared with you last month that we were hoping to get you know, the final copy of the Downtown business assessment and market uh, business analysis and market assessment uh, in its final report. And I wanted to get that, that out to you as soon as it's in its final format. Uh, the consultant has not delivered the final copy to us yet. She has committed that she will have it to me by January 22nd. There were some minor modifications um, that she needed to do, some final uh, cleanup and some uh, just acknowledgments. And I'm sorry that it's later than I had hoped it would be. Um, but I do have a commitment from her that it should get to me by the 22nd of January. When we get it, it'll be the final form and I'll send it out to um, you and city council. Uh, and uh, we can certainly schedule it for, for uh, discussion next month. Um, so the bottom line of it is, is that uh, she had done some analysis, both um, evaluating the pre COVID and then the period of COVID uh, business operations. Um, so that that's very helpful information to, for us to have. Uh, what she was impressed with was the level of response that we received uh, from both the community when we did the community survey and also the business community. I think there's a lot of terrific data in there and I'm very anxious to get it out into other people's hands. Uh, really one of the focuses was to identify what our strengths and what our weaknesses are in the downtown. And I think it's, it provides great information um, that will help us really, will more specifically guide focused efforts as we start to um, take action on that, that report. And as you know, that that report was done as a basis for the uh, Sustainable Greenfield Implementation Committee. Uh, we'll be doing an update to the downtown revitalization plan uh, this year. Uh, we have some community development block grant funding that's coming in after this report that will uh, allow us to really focus on not just knowing the, the characteristics of our downtown, but really focusing and outlining a plan for positive action. So I feel like we're in a pretty good place on that. Although, and again, my apologies that getting uh, the report has been later than I had hoped, but it it does provide some very strong and fresh data and it's you know even during COVID I mean I think that um, that that was a very bad you know even though it was like mm, should we really be doing this survey work during uh, COVID but I think we're 
now that the vaccination is happening and uh, we all can see a light at the end of the tunnel that we're feeling hopeful and optimistic. And I feel that throughout my conversations with the business community, both the GBA and you know, uh, business owners on the street is, is that there's a great sense that, you know, at least we, we have a time, we have a plan and a time frame now. So, so. And are there any updates on the First National Bank? Yeah, the, I, and I can get the First National Bank report out to you. Um, the uh, Greenfield Redevelopment Authority met last month to receive that report from the consultant and we went through it pretty pretty much in depth. You know that the original game plan, the original conversation with the First National Bank is the thought that it would be a, a flexible cultural space um, that would serve many, many needs in the downtown. Uh, that conversation started back around 2014 as we came out of the master planning piece. Um, although actually the, even before then there had been that dream uh, for the use of the space. Um, coming out of that report, it was pretty clear that because of some site constraints, uh, the cost of the renovation and um, the, the, the reality is, is that with our energy and enthusiasm about arts and culture in downtown, other, other entities, other organizations, other parties actually picked up the reins and moved forward on making downtown Greenfield or bringing new things to downtown Greenfield uh, that have actually done a lot to enliven the downtown. Um, so the, the next question, but, and uh, the goal of the redevelopment authority was to be able to generate uh, if we were going to do something that it would be have to be revenue neutral, that is not cost the city anything substantial to be able to operate it. And the uh, consultant did a pretty thorough inventory of um, arts and cultural uh, organizations up and down the valley. Um, and and so, uh, we have a, a mass development, a state agency that does redevelopment of downtown properties met with us at this meeting to receive the report. And the general consensus is that it, it wasn't going to fly as a cultural art space. Um, there were a lot of other good things happening in the downtown, but the other point was is that this is still a very high profile and important property. And so, what can we do with it? Uh, one point that the um, the woman from Mass Development made is she said, frequently in many of these uh, properties that they're looking at that get revitalized into a cultural art art space. What drives it is an existing arts or culture organization that's looking for a piece of real estate. And she said, we, we were driving it in the other direction. We had a piece of real estate and we were trying to fit arts and culture uses into it. Um, so uh, arts and culture facility, probably off the map, uh, off, the, off the list for that property right now. And the question is, what do we do with it as a real estate property? And mass development has committed to stay with us as we try to move forward and evaluate what we can do because everyone recognizes it's been vacant way too long. It's in a high profile location. It cannot continue to sit and blight our downtown. So, and uh, the redevelopment authority, we received the report in December. We're meeting in January to, um, you know, we wanted to hear the report and then sort of ruminate on it. And then we're coming back together to start thinking about next steps with the property. So that will happen in January. And so if you can put me on your agenda again for February, I hope I'll be in a much better place uh, with uh, a little more information than I have this evening. But I appreciate your interest in it. And I do think it's a very important, both of those uh, efforts are a very important uh, initiative for us to keep our eyes on. Uh, yes, Councilor Elmer, go ahead. Um. I know I, I've had a fantasy of having Apple turn that into an <laughs> Apple store. Yes, you have. And, um, I, you know, as I got to know the building better, I saw the fatal flaw with that plan, which is there's no way to back a truck up uh, to uh, discreetly unload your secret phones. Um, in fact, there's no way really to get, you know, more than a person through into the back. So, um, my, my new plan, which the mayor has given me the green light, is to is to re-pitch Apple, uh, pitching the town as a as a, hmm. you know, a lo great location. Make the same business case that there's only one Apple store west of you know, um, 
I forget where, but in, and none in New Hampshire, uh, none close in New Hampshire, none in Vermont, and the one, the only one uh, within driving distance, is uh, so backed up that you can't get an appointment, and they're they're crying for yeah. help. So, uh, and I, I, I'm not smart enough to know where they would, what properties in Greenfield they would want. Um, I can think of a few, uh, but my my proposal to the mayor was that I redraft her letter, pitching the town, suggesting that we have several properties that are you know crying for a new owner. Um, and I could actually could use your advice. Is it worth mentioning the bank? I would also mention Wilson's. Uh, uh, I don't know whether the co-op has a has a workable plan to take it over, but uh, there are other places for the co-op to expand. There are other properties that Apple might be interested in. Anyway, um, I'm working on that in my head. I haven't written it yet. Um, you know, and I I think. I think downtown Greenfield would be a perfect location for an Apple store. Me too. Uh, you know, and, and we do have several vacant storefronts uh, and, and some movement happening, you know, uh, you know, we'll see what happens with Wilson's and, and, you know, the co-op, I know that they haven't uh, eliminated Wilson's as a site, but I know we, that they're exploring other options. So, um, but I do think that the, the demographics and, and the possibility of what Greenfield can be as we come out of this pandemic is really something that people have been looking for before the pandemic. I think that that desire to live in a small town America is really accelerating. And I think we need to position ourselves so that we're attractive. And we are on so many fronts. I mean, specifically on the technology piece and the sort of the, the young and hip stuff that we have going on. Um, that I think really is is attractive because, you know, we hear that millennials don't want to live in places like uh, Greenfield, but we see them flocking here. And I think that as people are starting families and looking um, to, to make some, you know, to set down some roots, that Greenfield is a very attractive location for a whole variety of reasons, whole variety. So. I would say, Councillor Elmer, if you can somehow convince them to put the store in um the Chapman Street hole that would solve several of our problems at once. I would just well, the Wilson property, um, the Wilson's prop. I mean, Wilson has a lot of real estate. I mean, we all know the building, but the the land holdings uh, that uh, the family has uh, is really a big, fairly large piece of real estate in the downtown. Very large. Had his hand up for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah Councilor Jarvis. Sorry. Yeah, don't forget. Also, I know the. Um, just before I forget it, and and I'll, I'd move off of this committee, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, the uh, the property down at the west end of Main Street, the mall that's now closed, used to have Herms in it. Yeah. Um, that's fairly vacant. Um, access for TT units, um, par uh, parking. So just another piece of property that could be looked at. Two stories down there. So. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, we actually, um, one of the things that we are able to pull together as a result of this business. Oh. I was just saying that one, one of the things we have is a fairly good inventory and updated inventory of our downtown properties and the uses that were in them last July. <laughs> so. MJ, go ahead. If, if you could just send me your your list in the order you'd like them. My list of properties. <laughs> Happy to. Okay. Happy to. Any other questions for Director Adams from the committee? Um, I have a couple general things if you don't mind entertaining them. And actually, Director Letourneau might know, know some answers too. Um, I am curious about now that we're reasonably certain that COVID is not going away anytime soon. Um, what are the plans for next summer in terms of uh, working with restaurants and the kinds of things we put together last year? And also the um, redesign of Main Street. I know that that's moving forward, but I haven't gotten an update recently. I don't know that's more of a uh, Marlowe piece, but if anybody has any information, I'd love to hear a little bit about it. I can I can talk about what we're going to be doing with the restaurants and the outdoor dining. Um, we're going to circle around 
and revisit with the, the restaurant owners that have set up um, operations this summer. Uh, we have still have some flexibility to do some additional um, restaurants because uh, we've got more than enough planters and I know exactly where they are. First National Bank is a great storage facility. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> um, so the, the plan is to go back and uh, I was actually on a, a webinar this afternoon with people from around the state around the shared street um, and you know to, to really circle back and to see what they want to do and to get those set up you know in a more planful way we sort of were like shooting from our hip um, this summer but I think overall it was perceived to be as successful as it could have been uh, given the circumstances that we were in so yeah, I think if that was shoot shooting from the hip, you were very successful. You're an excellent shot. Well, I, I credit the restaurant owners on that. It was, you know, you listen to the folks who run their business and they they know their operations well enough to give us very clear information about what they needed from us. And and I've got to say, you know, the ability for the mayor to be able to do what she would do, what the licensing process was able to do and, and to pivot and to do that, that was critical. The other piece is the DPW was extraordinary to work with. And and the nice thing, I mean, you know, Danny and licensing and me and Marlo and the whole gang, we worked together quite effectively. Um, so and I've got to say, Paul's not with the city anymore, but Paul Raskovich just got his guys out there and moved stuff and put it together and man. <laughs> so it was, yeah, and I think everyone just rolled up their sleeves up with a can-do attitude and we, we made it work, so. That, that work was appreciated. Um, Director Laterno, did you have anything to add or I'm not necessarily? Yeah, um, I just want to echo what MJ said about um, the ability to kind of, we were sort of shooting from the hip, but I think during that process, we've, you know, kind of created our own checklist of what to do now for these things. <laughs> and um, yeah, <laughs> it, right. So, uh, and working with the different department heads to make sure that would happen, like DPW, I just remember standing in the middle of Ames Street and looking around at <laughs> what, what, the, what the ramifications were for closing the street down and some other things. And I think there were a few restaurants that at first didn't, weren't sure about, you know, doing the, the outdoor uh, service and then they got on board. And I think people are going to be interested in doing that as soon as it's even remotely warm out this year. And yeah, the licensing. Uh, the Board of License Commissioners, um, two things happened that made this possible that we're not sure how long this will last, but um, the state did uh, streamline the process for the outdoor liquor licenses. It's currently still in effect until 60 days after the end of the uh, state of emergency, whenever that is. But I, I think we may see some, some, you know, permanent changes from this. So it made it easier to then use your liquor license outdoors contiguous to your property. And then the second thing was the Board of License Commissioners um, delegated the authority to the mayor so that between their meetings this summer, we could quickly get them on board. Um, so those two things happened. Now, the second one we may not need, uh, depending on how things go, or they may just agree to do it again. But if we get on board before it, the warm season comes and get everybody you know, as MJ said, she's going to reach back out to restaurant owners and get everybody situated. We should have a nice, smooth process. Mm -hmm. It was fun. It was nice to be able to go out to eat. <laughs> so this is what it takes to um, move a, a blue law back in Massachusetts, just a pandemic. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so should I just follow up with Director Warner about the um the main street project so the main street project i do have a little bit of information um i know it is moving forward um it, it has i think what's going on is uh there are parts there are things that are slow because it's government and then there's things that happen fast when you hear so i think right now we're in a waiting section yeah um and there's other things that have to take priority this winter but um yeah i mean you should uh maybe invite him to a upcoming meeting to talk about that while you know while we're in the preparation mode for summertime and for street changes. Um, there's a few other things I know MJ's really spearheading the shared street stuff. So she'll be able to update you guys as that unfolds. Um, I think we, you know, we've, yeah, that's really, I guess all I can say about it right now. 
before I ramble. <laughs> Sounds great. Yeah, thank you. Just just looking for for a few updates. Um, I guess we mm -hmm. can move on. Oh, Councilor Elmer, did you have another thing? You're you're muted, Phil. Uh, we haven't seen the proposals, but I've already seen some pushback on Chris Collins's report about what they are, which he's reporting for the Franklin County Daily something or other. Um, so there, there, at least one business owner doesn't want, uh, doesn't like the parallel parking in front of his property and would rather have uh, vertical. And that's, I gather they're, they're talking about undoing the vertical and having more parallel anyway. So it, it seems like there's information out there that we don't have. Yeah, it, I don't think anything's 100% set in stone, but I do know there, you know, we're not gonna always get 100% of the people on board 100% of the time. But I think what we will do is make sure that there's public input and public notification in, you know, with enough time. One of the things that we did also that could help with some of the business owners that are concerned about making sure there's space for turnover of lots of cars. I don't see us undoing this anytime soon. We actually added a 15 minute spot to each block downtown. Um, last year, that was part of the plan because there was so much pickup and takeout. So mm -hmm. we can talk about that with the changes, making sure that that's in there. And that would, that would probably alleviate some of the complaints about losing parking is that we'll have these spots that'll be high turnover spots on each block. Yeah, go ahead, follow up. Just, yeah, just to follow up, actually my point is more that that there's information out there that, that isn't coming to the Economic Development Committee. Um, yeah. uh, I guess I, I, it feels like we should hear about it before Chris Collins does. Uh, you will, I think Chris Collins probably has the draft information that's floating out in the public from way, way back, because I don't think we've released anything else. So um, he's reporting on something that it was the initial draft plan way from way back, I, maybe 18, 19, 2019, 2020, mm -hmm. early 20. It was probably before this mayor was sworn in. So we haven't released anything else. We definitely haven't, uh, we'll definitely give it to the city officials first. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Director Adams, did I see your hand up? My screen was yeah, totally yeah. out of view. Yeah. No, one of the, one of the other shout outs that I wanted to do around the uh, downtown piece is re just really the yeoman's work that the uh, Greenfield Business Association also did. While the city funded the perimeter equipment, we didn't want to get into the, pro the <laughs> into the ownership situation where we owned all these tables that restaurants would use. So um, the GBA really uh, did a nice job doing some grant, got some grants and got those out to the, the business owners that had to make those acquisitions. So I'm very grateful that they did that. They're looking to continue to do that. In fact, we were just talking about it this morning. They had a strategic planning process and uh, getting, gearing up to go ahead and to get more equipment for the restaurants that are planning to do that outdoor dining. And and we also discussed about the, we, you know, we really focused on the downtown, uh, but really uh, focusing around the town, if there's other businesses, other uh, restaurants that wanna do the outdoor dining for us to be able to work with them. I think they were pretty much on their own. They did, you know, I know some of the franchises did some, but um, just trying to get more support to the broader business community for outdoor dining. So it's not just a downtown experience. Great. It's good to have good partners. Yes, Councilor Disorder. Um, I just one of you might know, is there a plan? Um, will Hope and Olives be okay with their outdoor dining, with the temporary fire station? Will they need to do that on the side? Does any, either of you know anything about that, um, D Director Adams or, or Danny? I'm looking to have the conversation with uh, Hope and Olive about um, doing it again. This well, I need to know the details of the the temporary <laughs> fire station myself. So, uh, I, I, so I do. Know. So the mayor actually did speak with the owners of Hope and Olive and yeah. kind of an unofficial way about what was going on with the parking lot when this became apparent that we may have a temporary fire station there and. Um, uh, 
uh, Jim Zakara was fine with it and said they'd make it work. Um, so even with an outdoor area. We do have a nice parking garage right near there, so. All right, if there's nothing else, um, let's move on. Director Laterno, would you mind giving us a quick update on your um, proposed changes to the licensing? Yeah, so um, the background on this for folks who don't know um, is that because it's a, it was a year ending in zero, uh, not only were they doing the um, charter review, they're also doing an entire code review. That would be the appointments and ordinances committee of the city council. And so my my work with the chair of ANO at the time, Dan Gwynn, was to reach out to department heads um, and help them, you know, tag flag the different pieces of the code. Uh, because licensing falls under the mayor's office, and I work closely with the licensing clerk. I worked with her um, to identify some things. And just to back up, actually, before that even happened, it kind of dovetailed nicely. Um, when the mayor um, was first sworn in, some of the goals were to look at some of that stuff to streamline and make um, some of the work we do with businesses, make it easier on the businesses without compromising safety and all those other things that are the reason why we have these rules. I met with Councillor Dolan back, feels like a hundred years ago. I think it was last yeah. January. So uh, it feels like 10 years ago. And we talked about, you know, where those priorities overlapped with some of the goals um, that he had. And so I worked with Lori Krikorian. Um, and we kind of identified the low hanging fruit, at least the ones that she knew had come up over the years and that the Board of License Commissioners were also interested in seeing some changes. And we submitted those as part of the code review. So this went to appointments and ordinances. I actually think I gave this stuff to them in September or October. So I don't know if they, I don't think they've acted on it yet in terms of review. Um, and somewhere in there, there was also the discussion about the survey, which was before my employee, but Councillor Dolan knows about that, the survey that went out to boards and commission chairs talking about their board, their commission, the, the mission, um, and, and any changes they would identify. So then, you know, zooming back into the licensing, there was just a few easy things. Um, and that is what EDC will be taking up. But I think, I mean, a and will be taking up, but I think bringing it to EDC is smart because it is kind of a, a good thing to give you guys an FYI on. Um, I can't, actually, I don't even know if it's on the agenda and I can't look at it sometimes I'm talking because I'm weird like that, but um, there are a few things that seemed like easy ones. And then there were a few things that did not jive with mass general law. And those were the ones we submitted. Um, there was a liquor license one that was out of date with mass general law. Um, there was the, the one that was already voted on this year was actually one that worked out nicely and we did it kind of quickly because of the outdoor dining due to COVID, um, which was that we, we, re, we previously had an ordinance that didn't allow under any circumstances, um, alcohol to be served on city property. So that what that did was made it so we couldn't even let people extend their liquor license outside if they're right next to a city owned sidewalk. So that one already got changed. I think that was actually in June or July. Um, and then these other ones were later on. So I think we did something with, Tim, do you know what ones we actually did? I have a whole list of others that we may be bringing forth this year, this year too. So just streamlining some language, um, making things, here's the background too. And this I learned from the licensing clerk who's been with the city for more than a decade. So she's seen a lot of things. A lot of the items that ended up under the umbrella of licensing um, were leftovers from when we had a select board and when the initial charter changes went through, it was pieces that either were obviously a license issue like liquor licenses or were sort of like that, were sort of a permit license approval process that didn't fall under another area. Um, and so some of them don't necessarily need to be under the purview of a board like that, or they could become an administrative process you could fill out a form and pay a fee, um, things like sandwich boards and things like that. Honestly, the reason why we even have a license for it actually makes sense once I learned, which is that we wanna make sure that folks who have such things have insurance. So if it blows down the road and hits somebody in the head, 
they'll deal with it. But I don't think it necessarily is something, I think we all agreed when we were talking last year, that it didn't feel like something that needed to ha go to and sit in front of a board and talk about. It could have been an administrative process. And I don't even remember if that one actually went through yet. It may not have. Um, that did not. We, we just got a package um, that were geared towards emergency COVID. Um, yeah. Okay. COVID related changes. Okay. Um, so I do have the ones I have. Uh, did I, send, I sent you that the other day, right? This is why I sent this to you. Yeah, it was the um, cleaning up the uh, alcohol permitting and yep. it, it was the tag sales. And there wasn't a lot tag sales. besides those two things, right? Tag sales were, well, tag sales were a bit of a mess. They were all over the place and it, and it used a lot of terminology like license uh, <clears throat> interchangeable. It used different words for the same thing, like permit versus license versus registration. Um, and the only reason why we really need those is because we want to make sure people aren't, you know, running an in illegal business that they're not being um, held account to, you know. So changing some of that rules, they really just have to register that with the town. Oh, and then the other one was, um, shoot, it was a good one. Oh, door-to-door uh, -door solicitation. Did we do that one? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's been presented. Door to door solicitation. There were a couple things that were in there that we figured out didn't jive with one thing. There was they didn't jive with Mass General Law. So how it worked before was there was a process. They submit it to licensing. Licensing then sent it to the police department to do background checks. People who go to door to door have to be vetted through the police department, which makes sense. Um, and then it comes back to licensing. Went before the board. It was like the, all these processes. So what we've proposed is a change where. Um, it's more along the lines of what a uh, livery or taxi driver does, which is they go through the PD first. They do their background stuff first because that background information is not made privy to the board anyway. So they really just need to know if they were approved or denied. If there's anything in the background that prohibits them from being a door to door, door salesperson. The other thing that was flagged in there was that there were very specific, there was very specific language about the kind of things in your background that would prohibit you from going door to door. We felt that that was a little outdated because it did include um, some low level, say cannabis uh, uh, convictions in the past. Um, and that just seemed out, out of date now that that's not even illegal. And um, <clears throat> I think the, the goal of those rules was to, to keep dangerous and violent and, uh, you know, predatory folks from coming door to door. So there's definitely a proposal in there to, to just kind of make that a little more specific so that folks who are um, doing a new job now aren't going to be prohibited from that because selling solar panels door to door because they got caught with a joint in 1993, you know? So those were the things. And then some of the other stuff, there were some laws about um, there was there was wording in our regulations around First Amendment and um, things that fall under the First Amendment, like religious door to door nonprofits, and that didn't jive with Mass General Law. We really just aren't supposed to restrict those at all. So uh, I think we're proposing striking that language altogether. That is excellent summary. It for now, there's a lot of other things we wanted to want to continue to tackle. So. Yeah. yeah, I think based on our conversation, however long ago that was, um, hmm. I mean, one of my goals is really to take a look at the licensing pro process for business and, and streamline it as much as possible. And I know mm -hmm. I tried to look at that and the, the relationship between what MGL requires and what our ordinances say. I, I, I just got bogged down trying to figure that out. So yeah, it might be beyond yeah, so my, way, my level. <laughs> so, yeah, so the way Lori and I have tackled it is we identified kind of a list based on she actually said that that survey was helpful because it helped her start the list. And then we went mm -hmm. through and just kind of pick, pick some that feel, felt like we called them like low hanging fruit to work on first. Mm -hmm. And then we actually had a meeting today where we talked about we're going to take a look after. Um, after the end of January, so next month. We're going to start taking a look at some of the ones that we haven't looked at yet. Um, you know, obviously making sure the mayor's on board with them. So that's where we'll probably talk about sandwich boards and things like that. I have a whole yeah. 
folder on my desktop of things I've dumped in there, language. And then I kind of like doing that. I kind of like seeing it, matching it up and seeing if it does match general law. I was on A&L yeah. when I was on the city council and I liked that a lot. So I think it's yeah. fun for Lori to have somebody who's weirdly enthusiastic about it, working with her <laughs> on some of that. Well, I'm, I'm fully supportive and if there's anything I can do, certainly let me know. Mm -hmm. Uh, Council yeah, Council so had a question. Yeah, I did have a question in the in the section uh, on fees. Uh, first of all, there's several typos in that last page. Uh, need, uh, the the um, junk the starts with junk dealers and noise and so forth. Um, but uh, maybe I read it too quickly. But it it seemed if I were the police department, I'd be nervous about uh, that the fees are determined by the police. Uh, and uh, I'd, I'd want more direction on that, on, on the fees charged for uh, for solicitors. I see now, reading it more closely, that the Board of Licensed Commissioners is also in on that. So, but that that's, they come up with a set of fees in advance, or do they do it on a case by case basis as people come to them? So, I think the fee uh, you're talking about the fees for the solicitation. So, yeah. So there were fees. There were fees associated back in the day. There were fees associated with actually creating a badge that the store to door solicita solicitor would have to show the citizens that um, they were approved through the city. And that was back in the day when it cost lots of money to create something. You had to like get it printed somewhere, or you it was you know an enormous amount of money to print it in the PD. Um, I don't think we've actually charged anybody fees for a very long time. On that, so that is something that can be struck altogether. The fees for the actual uh, for the actual um, light uh, item that they get to prove that they've received this uh, certification. Is that mm -hmm. the question you had? I guess I, it, it was just weird to have the police, you know, the fees not spelled out. And so yeah, so they, that's why it was determined by the PD because they were the one actually printing the badge. So people do get a badge. They will, yeah. So they get uh, get a license, uh, a piece of paper that it's not. It's no longer a badge um, that actually that they wear. It's now, I think, a piece of paper that they, they're supposed to have with them in case a citizen asks. But they're approved, and it's it it's it's now created the licensing department. Yeah. After I, the approval. I'm I'm familiar with those in, in New York City. Anybody asking you for money comes up with this piece of paper that you just don't trust. It looks like it's been in someone's pocket for 10 years. Yeah. Um, the, I, the other question that was raised by all this is uh, there are people soliciting for money all the time in front of buildings on Main Street. Yeah. Are they covered by this? Uh, no, it depends. So a lot of people you see on Main Street are probably like Clean Water Action or Mashburg. No, I think, I'm, I'm thinking of the 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 guys who sit on the ground in front of uh, the, the co-op and ask for this is yeah, door to door not, solicitation. Yeah, this I, is for door to door correct? solicitation. Yeah. yeah, those guys would be, I guess that would be a panhandling situation if you're just a person asking for money. Or if it's one of the folks that like sometimes you see walking around with a clipboard, that would be clean water action or one of those, those are nonprofits. The nonprofits are not covered under this ordinance because by mass general law, they're allowed to go door to door and they're allowed to solicit um, and or give out uh, materials. So if it's a charitable organization, a nonprofit organization, a religious organization, they're allowed to do that. They are encouraged to let the police department know if they're doing it, but they're not required to. So, so there's a whole class of unregistered solicitors that are not covered by this. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anything else on that? Yes, Councilor Tesoro. Oh, I wanted to say, I mean, I know Jenny put her hand up. If you guys are, go, if you're nerding out going through licensing related ordinances at any point in your free time and you see something, um, please go ahead and, and, and give me a heads up um, because I'll be working with licensing on some of this stuff and I'm happy to get a, get somebody to point something out for me if I haven't seen it already. I may just take you up on that. Um, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, 
Director Letourneau, I just wanted to point out, you probably know this, but uh, the business certificates um, that is actually required by Massachusetts general law. And we have many businesses that do not have business certificates that are in operation. And that actually is what um, triggers um, assessors looking at them. And I, right. I keep checking on several of them, which although they're operating and have leases and are continuing, they do not have business certificates. And I spoke to Director yeah, you know Torog about that to see if that might be incorporated yeah. in the special permitting process, but somehow we that's getting lost in the shuffle. It is a weird process. Um, I've learned a lot about that. So if you are running a business in Greenfield and you need to get a business certificate, that's actually through the clerk's office, but you may, depending on the type of business, you may also need to go to the licensing. So for example, a junk dealer also incorporates um, like antique stores, which we have a lot of, right? So if you are opening a little antique shop on Main Street, you need a business certificate from the clerk's office. You also need a junk dealer's license, which Hopefully, if you go to one or the other, we usually will tell you you need the other as well. If uh, you're just popping up and doing it and you are operating your business, unless somebody complains, which which ha actually did happen this year because of COVID, there was a lot more oversight. There were a lot more eyes on businesses because they were checking for compliance in COVID and then unearthing that these folks didn't have all of their business in order. I think it would, I don't know how to do this, but it keeps coming to mind that there it would be great if we could have a, maybe MJ and I should talk about this, if we could have some sort of, um, I don't know, one-stop place for people who do business to talk to that one person to be like, what do I need to do, blah, blah, blah. And then we also don't have really, other than the building inspector, the health inspector, we don't really have an enforcement agent of that variety. So really we rely on neighbors or people noticing things. Um, and then, you know, if we notice that so-and-so has uh, a business on this street, we may check to see, and then, you know, if somebody knows them because it's Greenfield and it's not that big, we'll give them a call and say, do you know you're not in compliance? And I've done that um, and try and get them in a, in a compliance. But it, it would be better if it wasn't being caught just because it happened. So I yeah. totally know what you mean, Counselor Disorder. MJ. Uh, uh, we actually, as we did the uh, micro enterprise assistance program, um, that was one of the things that we required is, is that they needed a DBA. They had to have a DBA and we had several of them that ended up going through the town's process because, you know, it's, it's those, it's that little thing that nobody, nobody does compliance checks on it. Uh, and it, you know, if you're operating under your own name, you're, you're okay. But once you're doing business as something other than your own name, then there is this licensing process and, and it does check, it does, you know, the zoning, uh, the building inspector has to sign off on it and the uh, the property owner needs to sign off if it's you know if it's out in the neighborhood so you know it's a, it's actually a good little check and balance to make sure everybody's doing it but and we have been the mayor and, and Danny and I have talked about you know when somebody comes into town hall and says what do I need to do to start up a business there should be a pretty straightforward little checklist and there should be someone who can sort of say well tell me what you're planning to do and we'll tell you what you need to do <laughs> so <clears throat> Yeah, we're talking about trying to, that's a wish list item for hopefully not too long in the future, figure out a way to do that, like a business Sherpa or a per, personal helper yeah. in City Hall. Concierge. Even, even Concierge. Concierge, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want to do that. That's what I want my job to be. Well, let's hope that there's some grant money coming up for a position like that. <laughs> I don't want it to be my job in addition to my current job. Though, so I'll just be quiet about it. <laughs> There's no time. Anything else okay. on that? I think licensing is an ongoing process, but this is kind of what we have in the pipeline at the moment. So let's There's move on to our last, <laughs> our last item, which is just a discussion about um, about assessments. We had kind of um, at the last meeting said we would talk about it and maybe try to sketch out a couple of next steps. Um, of course, those next steps will happen without Councillor Jarvis and I um, and with Councillor Stemple, who's joining us. So um, 
you know, I, I may take a back seat in this conversation, although I'm fully supportive of the idea. Mm. Yes, uh, Phil. Oh, you're muted. I spoke last time um, about uh, trying to do some kind of system, sy systematic study of assessments in Greenfield uh, to see whether properties that were either over-assessed or under-assessed would pop out and uh, give uh, the assess assessors a, a starting point. Um, uh, I, I, I did reach out to... Uh, the hacker types who might be able to do this kind of stuff. Uh, but uh, I quickly found out that th what they wanted was a spreadsheet that had all the information on it, and then they could do it. Uh, I was hoping they could like pull up the property cards one at a time. Um, the There is, um, Zillow does uh, let you download spreadsheets. Uh, but when we looked at them, it was just the, it was the assessments uh, as the town had them. They make something called a Zestimate, which mm -hmm. is, which is uh, created by an algorithm that lumps properties that are nearby each other and then makes an estimate about what, what they ought to cost. And there are a lot of discrepancies between the, the council's, the, uh, the town's assessment and the Zestimate. Um, but, uh, the the zestimates are not included in those uh, in the in the thing you can download, and uh, I got a very chilly reception from uh, the assessor's office when I asked them whether they might have a uh, an account because uh, because cities can get free access to this data uh, from Zillow, but uh, they were I was told that we would get into a lot of trouble with the state if we even touched Zillow data. It's not. Uh, considered state worthy uh, or Commonwealth worth worthy. So that that uh, I ran into a couple of brick walls with that. Uh, I I do think there might be a way to go to run a program that went street by street. Um, I'm not sure whether that would unearth the kind of information that we want. Um, I actually talked to Councillor Disorder about this. Uh, she was not encouraging. Mm -hmm. That's what I have to say. Ginny, you might follow up. I, I, I see that Councillor Stemple, did, you had your name up before. Did you did you want to say something first? I was just saying that that creates an interesting conversation about the relationship between assessment and appraisal. Um, I think assessment is a very unique tool that communities have, for example, in Greenfield, Yes, our tax, our, the number of our tax percentage is high, but our assessments are traditionally low, which creates a lower tax bill. Um, and that's a conversation we've been trying to have with the public for quite some time. Um, and so that's strategically one way we could lower the tax rate um, by raising tax assessments while keeping the tax bill the same. Um, uh, so, I mean, it's an interesting conversation to have, um, but it's quite the undertaking. And so uh, I see Phil's raising his hand and that's kind of like all I really wanted to say. Let's let's go to Councilor Disorder because I think she's been waiting. Uh, well, I think it is pretty labor intensive. I actually have something sort of prepared on on main on the main street property on the main street businesses and I, I think that our chief assessor knows that there are issues there so but when we spoke with as I usually attend those meetings and although we have allotted money thirty thousand dollars I, I believe the city council has allotted to the assessing department to take care of that she has no hopes that they'll be able to do that. Um, but she thought it would take five years. And so um, that that is a little discouraging, but um, she could see too that there's quite a disparity there. 
So um, that's one piece of that. And another, another piece, I think um, at some point we're going to have a meeting, a TIF meeting, because I, I could see on that list there was one of those that had a 100% TIF that's been in existence for a little bit, um, couple, two or three years. And um, it was decreasing by 10% per year. But I, I think that that bears a lot of thought and a lot of looking into. And and they, they're going to have quite the year ahead of them be, because the, the CPA will, that will be impacting the assessing office. So that that may be something that we need to look at even as we're going forward with our budget for next year. So, um, be, yes, that is a, it is problematic, but if it were, if it were done, if it were done and done properly and we put the money there to get that job done, um, I, I think we'd see more revenue in, in the, to bringing more revenue to the town. Uh, let's go with, uh, Council Hirschfeld next, because we haven't heard from him much. Yes, uh, oh, I think it was last, yeah, sometime last year, I, uh, when I came on my, uh, um, on this committee, I went to Montague Assessment, uh, Assessor's Office, and I spoke with the assessor, and she mentioned that they had gotten, um, significant amount of money from utilities that under themselves. Um, and they, I think they even threatened to go to court and uh, they won. Uh, so I mentioned this to our assessors and I sort of got pushed off <laughs> saying everything was fine. But I, I wonder if uh, uh, we might have the same problem that uh, Montague had in terms of the assessment of utilities, utility companies. It's worth uh, looking into. Absolutely. Um, Councilor Elmer, did you have a follow-up? You're, you're muted again. Yeah, I, I was just gonna say that um, if, if Greenfield goes the way we hope, things will change uh, with a a new library and a new fire station and a, and a more welcoming town, uh, property values will go up. And uh, and I don't know exactly how assessments follow valuation, uh, but it's it it uh, I suspect it's something we're going to have to deal with. That's the only thought I had. It wasn't much. Yeah, and Councillor Stemple. Uh, yeah, and to Councillor Hirschfeld's point. It's almost like considering being the services center of the county, I think it's it's a very complex job to look at reassessment um, across the board, whether we're looking at, I, gosh, we must have allocated that 30,000 three years, no, four years ago. I can't I remember. It was 2018, th February, I think. Um, and nothing's been done with it, but with understanding that's very complicated. And to Councillor Elmer's point, does it even make sense to reassess all of these properties before putting in a fire station in a library? Probably not. Things are gonna shift, things are gonna change. Um, but that being said, it'd be interesting to have the plan at the ready. Um, and obviously that's not our place. I don't wanna, I certainly don't wanna tell um, Kimberly what to do, because I'm not the expert, she certainly is. But it would be nice to know that there's a plan in place to do the work once those buildings are there, or at least with the knowledge that they're coming. And um, Director Letourneau. Hi, yeah, I just wanted to say that we have had a few meetings with the, the mayor's office, have had a few meetings with the assessor's office in terms of what they, um, you know, what Kimberly thinks is happening. And it is my understanding that that money out, that was allocated by the council has been being used in, in part for the consulting services that we are using. So it's not like it's not being used. It is being used 
hasn't been used up. There's still some money left in there. They've been utilizing a consulting service to, service who helps them with the assessments because it is one and three quarter people right now. Um, so it is being used for that, and that is where we are um, getting some of the reevaluations. Re but yeah, we're supposed to be doing it. I think everybody should expect to get a visit from an assessor in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts every 10 years, five to 10 years, and it's definitely been more than that for many people, and she's working on getting caught up on that and working very hard to do that, and we're gonna try and help her. And uh, also, we've been discussing with the assessor's office uh, what, what would be their needs um, in terms of staffing and things going forward for the budget to help with that. So that conversation is happening right now. And Councillor Stemple again. Just a clarification. So when you, Director Letourneau, Chief of Staff Letourneau, when you say that we're using that money um, now and then everyone in 10 years is going to get a visit by the assessor. So our concern back in 2018 was allocating the money specifically for the use that the burden tends to fall on the resident versus the businesses. So residents are getting reassessed, reassessed, reassessed. Yet to Councillor Desorgers, Chair Desorgers' point, we've we have been, I guess, when you look at the assessment of a downtown building that sold for over a million when it's assessed at three hundred thousand, there's a huge discrepancy versus uh, my neighbor's house being assessed at a hundred. And like, I'll use my father's house; it's assessed at something crazy, um, something that he couldn't even sell it for, and even in this market right now. And so the, the shoulder of burden, we 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 don't we specifically allocated 30 grand. We cut it in half, not 60 grand, but 30 grand. So we can focus on, and it was Councillor Mass's idea to focus on the commercial property. And obviously that's an arbitrary number because we don't know what it really costs. But so I'm curious, it's the council's will that the knocking on the door will be those business buildings. Um and give some break to residents. I see Councillor Jarvis shaking his head. I'm just curious what he's shaking his head for. No, no, no. I think for people to realize if an assessor shows up at a building or a house, the owner has no obligation to let them in. Yes. Yeah. So, so we'd have to realize that just because they show up, their assessment value could stay the same if they tell them, no, you can't come in. So I just want people to understand that, that the assessor and the assessor showing up at property isn't the ends all to resolving this issue. Yeah, and the the poor assessor who has the job of knocking on doors to do it. <laughs> so I can, like answer, a, I can answer that, Councillor Stemple, your question. So that ahead, I, please, so I, was, yeah. I was not clear. I was not clear. There's it's two different things we're talking about. One, generally in a perfect world, one should expect to be in person visited by an assessor, and that is both residential and commercial properties, at least every 10 years. This is what I've been told by kind of those are the guidelines. We have been way beyond that for commercial, but we were also way beyond that for many, and this was a surprise to me, residential. My understanding, and I may be mistaken, but my understanding is that some of that money was allocated was for this consultant service to help, particularly, you're right, some of the commercial stuff, but then that frees up our actual assessors who work for the city that go and do some of the residential. But there are residential properties, despite the disparities in residential properties, assessments going up or seeming to go up higher than commercial, which has been going on a long time. I remember having this conversation 15 years ago about split tax and things like that and how to address this. But we have residential properties that haven't had anybody being, you know, go inside of them for or ask, even ask, as Councillor Jarvis pointed out, the resident can say no. And being a good Laterno daughter that I was, I was one of those people for a long time, but now I'm like, come on in. <laughs> so um, anyway, some, there are the residential properties, there are many that haven't had the in-person visit either um, for a very long time. So they're working on both, both, both. Um, I would have to look I'm gonna, at exactly where, what's going on with that money, but I think that's part of what that was allocated for was part of that. I'm going to jump in here. Um, what I'm seeing is a microcosm 
of the kind of conflict that assessment always brings up in every community yeah. nationwide. Um, I mean, this is a really thorny and complicated issue. And I think no matter where we get, there will always be someone who thinks something about it is unfair. And one of the hard things about our job is um, figuring out policy wise, how we can, you know, um, do it as fairly as possible. And that is a noble and difficult, um, you know, job for the Economic Development Committee going forward. I would say a couple of things. Um, I do think it's really important that we differentiate between residential, commercial, and industrial as we go forward and perhaps see what discrepancies arise between those three and also geographically across town. Um, that's made more complicated by this absolutely bonkers real estate market that we are in right now. Um, on a final note, I would just say we pay the consulting firm a lot of money every year. And we should absolutely have access to every piece of data. We should not have to go through Zillow. We should be able to get them to produce any report that we want on properties. We should be able to get them to put any spreadsheet together. And we should get them to be able to explain exactly their reasoning behind each particular assessment, you know, which algorithms they used and which factors were factored in. And that might be a starting place actually is, is if I could make a suggestion for going forward is really figure out what those pieces of data that will tell the story effectively are and then ask for them. We, it's public information, we have a right to it and we need it to make good decisions. So that's one suggestion. I think I, I've lost count a little bit. I'm going to go with Councillor Stemple because her hand up is right is up right now. Um, so that's two things. So I, I re initially rose my hand to complicate this even further because I know that it was submitted to a project is to eventually look at the RA zone and slice and dice into more finite zones. And so throw that into the mix of what you, Councilor Dolan, were saying about assessing between commercial and industrial. Yeah. Um, let's just keep making it more complicated. And then second, I'd be interested, Councilor DeZorger, to have, um, if this is something that we're, we're able to have, um, I guess, like kick off this discussion about assessment, if we're going to continue having it by inviting the consulting firm here to this committee um to kind of what's to kind of like dive into like what's available and what can you be giving us and maybe it's a quarterly thing that we're able to look at as a committee anyone else comments on this topic i think we could talk about it all night probably just Please. Um, that, it sounds like a great idea, Councillor Stemple, um, and I, I do think it's something that we need to delve into because we, uh, we our revenue has gone down from industrial, um, increased somewhat in commercial, but a lot of that that we've increased is for nonprofits. Those are the ones that are um, going up the most. The assessments of the the nonprofit commercial. So it definitely is something that we need to look at, but that was a great idea. Thank you. All right. Well, I, I look forward to um, seeing where this goes in 2021 and getting updates. Um, on our, that's the last thing on our agenda, unless there's I don't see any, but everyone's kind of frozen. Councilor Elmer, yeah, I see you now. You're muted again. Move to adjourn. No, 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 don't do that. Don't okay. do that. Okay. Um, can can I, I ask? Can I ask that we just get through the rest of the agenda? There are just a couple of things, procedural things. So. Um, if you don't mind, you certainly have the right to move that, but um, Councilor Semple. Um, I apologize for being late, newborn calls, um, but I just wanted to add to the first bullet point under discussion, community and small business in downtown Greenfield survey report. 
that in 2019, EDC um, also uh, did a survey for businesses in Greenfield, and I do have those results. We, we only received eight people um, responses, but they were pretty valuable, so I can export that and share it with the committee via Tammy or Kathy and uh, Director Letourneau. I owe that to you as well. And I think I owe it to Director Adams as well. So I'll share that out this week. Um, and then I also want to remind folks that we did do the panel discussion in 2019. And those are some qualitative, um, qualitative nuanced conversations that we can definitely like dive. I, the failure is that it wasn't recorded. Um, but we can definitely dive down into some of the um, nuanced comments that the panel made because the conversation was really good. And I just wanted to also say um, my biggest regret from the invitations to that panel were that I left out um, major stakeholders like Tim Grader and landlords. I left them out of the conversation because I just wasn't thinking about them as a big piece of that. And it was a big missed opportunity. Um, and so in the future, when we think about greenfield businesses and stuff like that, um, I want to make sure that this committee considers our um, landlords as a part of that discussion. Because I know that he felt slighted that he wasn't included. And it was completely my bad. Um, so I just wanted to kind of bring those two other pieces of research into that discussion. So when we continue it this year that we're including those. All right, thank you very much. Um, moving along, we have no motions. Any new business? Any old business? Uh, not seeing any. The next meeting will be February 9th at 6 p.m. right here on WebEx. And as a concluding note, um, this is my last EDC meeting as a member, probably ever. So um, I've really enjoyed this committee. Secretly, it was always my favorite. And, um, <laughs> and I really appreciate everybody's work in this last, you know, very chaotic year that we've had. Um, and don't worry, I will be back to talk about zoning at the next meeting because I submitted a, a um, an amendment. <laughs> and I also plan to keep you all accountable as a small business owner. So don't worry, this is not the last you'll see me. <laughs> but thank you all for uh, really from the bottom of my heart for the, the year that we've had. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, do I hear a motion to adjourn? The motion to adjourn. Motion by okay. Elmer, second by Jarvis, and um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, so any abstentions? Motion, uh, meeting is adjourned at 7.08 p.m. Thank you all very much. Have a good night.